Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeannie, and I am most definitely an alcoholic. Um, I am grateful to be here. Thank you, Sunday Night Speakers, for asking me. I just, I was um, overwhelmed with emotion when I got asked just to actually speak because um, AA has done so much for me. So um, let's just get on with the spiel here. <laughs> um, what, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. Um, I had my first drink. Before I was born, I was born to an addict. She drank and smoked throughout pregnancy. Um, no idea who my father is, so family life is a little bit crazy. Had my first shot before I was a year old. Counter space and high chairs were kind of seen as the same thing. Somebody put a shot of alcohol on my high chair. Down it went before anybody knew what happened. The story is legend in the family. <laughs> I could do shots before I was a year old. I was beer runner at age four. I um, started my illustrious career in the restaurant industry. <laughs> I uh, could pop the top off of a bottle, take a drink, wipe off the top, and get back to the person before they ever knew what happened. So alcohol has just been a part of my life. I uh, went to school when in uh, fifth, you know, uh, five or six years old, you go to school. School is really weird for me because I didn't understand reading, writing, numbers, and they had roles and they had consequences. There were no rules in my household. <laughs> the only rules we really had was um, lying is always an option. <laughs> Maybe hopefully a first option. And if um, if your mom's alibi, you better back up that lie. <laughs> you better be the one who's saying, yeah, that's where she was. So they didn't really like lying at school. That didn't go over too well. And uh, learning disabilities weren't really known about in the 70s. They just, at least at the school I went to. So they didn't know how to teach me. So people like me got put to the back of the class. We were the stoners. <laughs> we were the partiers. We were the ones that grew up together because we didn't belong to anybody else. So we belonged to each other. Um, teenage years were just troublesome. I uh, got in some big trouble when I was 16. There was going to be a little jail time happening. And uh, so the judge took pity on me and said, if you go back and live with your mother, mother had to take me back to <laughs> if I go, um, if I went back to school, got enrolled in school and getting a job was going to be, you know, kind of really important. So I did all those things. And I went to an alternative high school where they knew how to teach people like me. And I actually got my diploma and blew me away that I could do that. I got a job waiting tables when I was 16 and have waited tables and been in the restaurant industry ever since. Um, so that's what it was like. Oh, I met the man of my dreams when I was 22. <laughs> he had a job. He had a house. He had a truck. He had a Camaro. And he'd never been arrested, ever. <laughs> I wouldn't go to jail with this man. I wouldn't have to go visit him in jail. It's kind of a foreign concept. He was on his country club's swim team. This was blew me away. And he had a mom and a dad. They weren't married anymore, but he knew who both of them were, and he saw them on a regular basis. This was just foreign. So, I, And the man could drink, and he always had alcohol around. So he was my dream man. He had a very high tolerance, too. He could drink just a hellacious amount and have nothing happen. So I could drink and I didn't have to worry about it because he would always take care of me. So we got married and everything was great. We had friends and we partied and, you know, there weren't, there weren't any DWIs and that kind of stuff. But then I got pregnant and I couldn't drink when I was pregnant. I tried. I definitely tried. I couldn't. I puked. The smell of alcohol just made me sick. And this is from like being pregnant for two weeks on. It didn't take much. I just couldn't drink. So the problem was that my husband had lost his drinking partner, had lost a person who kind of made everything look okay. And I wanted to raise a child in a household that didn't have alcohol. That didn't go over too well with him. So not having a dad, I didn't want to be away. I didn't want my kids to grow up without a dad. I, I, so I stayed with him. We had uh, three kids in five years, and he isolated. Isolated us from our friends, isolated us from my family. His family was okay but my family wasn't. So I did that for 24 years. And uh, 
what happened, this is what happened, that's what it was like, this is what happened. Um, he had a heart attack in August 2nd of 2015, and the doctor said he, he died twice, he had two blocked arteries, had two stints put in, and the doctor said, your cholesterol is fine, you're not overweight, you don't have a family history, it's from smoking and drinking. That's the only reason why you had a heart attack. And he spent six days in ICU. Within 30 days, he was drinking and smoking again. And that's when I knew I couldn't live this life anymore. My two girls, my oldest two, were off in college, and I was um, feeling pretty good about where I was at. When I told my husband I was going to leave, he actually told me what he thought about me all these years. And I was blown away that I'd live with somebody who hated me that much. I couldn't believe the stuff that came out of his mouth. So I grabbed my clothes the next morning, grabbed my car, and I moved into a 187 square foot apartment. I walked away from everything. Walked away from a 16 year old son as well. My son doesn't want anything to do with me now because I left his dad. So <laughs> that's what happened. What happened to me? I lived in my little tiny, my little tiny closet. <laughs> For nine days. And why I drank was because of my husband. Really? That's why I drank. No, I spiraled out of control. I drank hellaciously for nine days. I was within a half a mile of work. I could walk to work. I could walk to QFC and walk back to my closet and do nothing but drink. And I woke up on a Sunday morning at two o'clock in the morning from passing out. I woke up and I thought, this is it. I'm done. This is why I left my husband. This is what I can't live this life anymore. There has to be another way. How am I going to do this? And I online, boom, AA, walked into a meeting. And this is how I know God has a sense of humor. I walked into Ballard Swedish Hospital. And it's a nine o'clock meeting on Sundays. And it's full of pregnant women. <laughs> The only time I couldn't drink in my whole entire life was when I was pregnant. The only time I was healthy, the only time I really felt good. And I'm surrounded by these women, and I'm like, whoa, this is weird. But And it's an hour and a half meeting, and some people, I don't know if there's anybody here who was there, but I do have some people who love to tell me what a mess I was, what a train wreck I was when I walked in. And I was cleaned up. I thought I was looking pretty good. I thought I had it together. Not even close. So I sat in the corner, and um, they have a break, and people came up to me, and I just kind of shook and just kind of cried is what I really remember. And um, people were very kind to me. They didn't, like, rush me. I think they were worried. I was timid. <laughs> I was going to bolt at any moment. So I went to the I went to that meeting and uh, they told me about this meeting and I walked in this room and I sat back there in the corner and um, and shook and I did cry when they said you know is there anybody here who has uh, 30 days or less and it was like me and they said oh we'll give you a 24 hour coin somebody walked up to me later give you a 24 hour coin I said you got a 12 hour coin because <laughs> I can't do 24 <laughs> you know that that time we're not there yet <laughs> so. But I, I met my first sponsor here that night, and she was actually moving um, in two weeks, because that's my life. People just come and go <laughs> pretty quickly. But um, she was very kind, and she walked me through through the very beginning parts of having a sponsor. Um, my home group is, is Morning Rush. Um, yeah, we're a bunch of crazy people. I get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and it's seven days a week. And that's what I needed from them um, was seven days a week. And these people were my tribe. I found them on Tuesday. Sunday is my first day of sobriety. And then Tuesday is when I found them and they embraced me and they just loved me. And, um, I got a service position within a week and, uh, I just showed up there for a, a, every day for probably, I'm going to say three months. <laughs> you were going to expect to see Jeannie there. Um, I emotionally threw up on these people <laughs> and, they, and they still like, you know, saw me come back the next day and they were like, Hey, Jeannie. I'm like, wow, they actually care. Um, but, and, and then after six months they said, honey, we're not therapy. Uh, we love you, but we're not therapy. You got some stuff going on. You're going to have to work on. So I went and, and, and I went into a program at UW and I did it for six months and it was wonderful. Um, cognitive therapy. I highly recommend it because the thoughts that go on in our head are not right. Uh, so that's basically, you know, um, what I want to do is share my strength and my hope. I can't believe I'm sober. I have never been this sober any time in my whole entire life for a span of 18 months. Um, I'm just now kind of feeling the waters and I'm just now kind of feeling comfortable. Um, a lot of my friends here will be happy to know. Yes, today I did get a sponsor. That will uh, make some people happy because I've been through three wonderful, lovely ladies tried to walk me through it, and I never trusted anybody. It, trust was not part of 
my my makeup. I never let anybody closer than this. And even my tribe at Morning Rush know that as well. There's only so close you get to Jeannie. So this gal, I've known her for about seven months now. And um, she didn't say sponsor. She said, let's go through the steps together. I thought, okay, I can do that. Because my my home group actually put together a step study. I swear to God, it was just for me to go through the steps. (laughs) They're like, you need that four-step girl. Let's go. (laughs) So, uh, And that's slowly coming to an end. And the four-step definitely needs to be in the fifth step. You definitely have to have somebody walk you through. You can't do it on your own. So um, what I've got from this is um, a loving community that I feel like I can go to no matter what is going on in my life. There are people I can turn to now that I couldn't turn to before. Um, walking through the world without alcohol was really something that I had no idea how to do. Um, I'm learning how to do it now. When I do want to drink, I talk to someone. And um, and then I remember, yeah, these past 18 months have been pretty good. Before that, it was really, really hard. And, and, and another reason for AA is I found out I really felt sorry for myself. It was a self-pity thing. That's why I drank because all these things were wrong. And then my life was so sad. And all these things went wrong with my husband and blah, 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 blah. It was just because I felt sorry for myself. I was a whiner. And, and it was all on me. It's my responsibility to be happy. It's my responsibility to take care of of what Jeannie needs. Nobody's going to tell me what I need. I got to figure out what I need. And then I have to be able to be confident enough to be able to ask for what I need. And that has worked for my job. That's worked for um, trying to get the divorce through my, you know, get my husband to divorce me or me divorce him or however we're going to do that. Um, it's uh, it's finding out what I want and being able to ask for it. So that's pretty much what AA has taught me. And uh, again, I'm just grateful to be here. Thank you guys for letting me come up and uh, do my spiel. I have three and a half minutes left. Okay, am I good? Am I good? Okay, cool. Hello, my name is Bob. I'm alcoholic. Sobriety date is uh, March 17th, 2011. My home group is uh, Waterfront over in West Seattle. I also attend uh, Morning Rush most mornings. Uh, Thanks for asking me to speak, Laura Lee, wherever she is. Uh, It lit a fire under me. since I've been asked, I stopped smoking. Uh, <laughs> I got a new sponsor and uh, committed to uh, peel the onion a bit more. Uh, I thought I should be as sober as can be when I got up here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I uh, I don't wake up every day full of uh, joy and wonder, you know, but uh, this thing hasn't really... Uh, hit me like a bolt of lightning, but uh, I got to say, life's a whole lot better than it was uh, back on St. Patty's Day 2011. I had no idea it was St. Patty's Day. It was just, uh, I'll call it my higher power, and I'll spend a little time uh, talking about that, because that's a big part of what happened. Uh, you know, what it was was real bad. It, uh, You know, I am. you can read the book, and I'm a textbook alcoholic. You know, I, uh, my story is in there. Uh, alcohol just took everything that I ever uh, hoped to be or thought I was, you know, and uh, I had uh, all kinds of great accomplishments and great opportunities at a life that, uh, you know, and when I was 21, uh, I went to Hawaii to get away from smoking pot and, uh, (laughs) you know, it worked for a little while, <laughs> and uh, you know I had a I had a a, a job a career fell in my lap over there Bob's Bargain Rentals uh, uh, that uh, you know I could have been set up for life and uh, and after six years doing that it was uh, my dad was going to retire there with mom and but alcohol was uh, more important took that away so. Um, I took the marriage away. That was, and then so I made it. I did a geographical. It really didn't sink. It didn't even dawn on me that alcohol had anything to do with the failure of all that at the time. So I scurried back to Seattle and I quickly married my high school sweetheart and uh, and bought a beautiful house, you know, up on the hill above the ferry dock in West Seattle and uh, and started uh, Auto Bob and uh, fixed cars out of my house for twenty years and. Uh, you know, became real busy with AA back in 88. I came in and uh, and got five years. But I stopped going to meetings at three years. When I tried to get a coin at four years, they told me they wouldn't give it to me. They said, you ought to try and give away what you've been so freely given. And uh, 
So that pissed me off. So, <laughs> you know, so I stopped going to meetings. Anyway, I, uh, <laughs> I relapsed for five years, and it went, went, you know, just like the book said, it went hard. You know, I'd been clean for five years, and in one night, I'm like swinging naked on a halyard off, uh, off the stern of some ship in the middle of the Mediterranean going 18 knots, and, uh, you know, just right out of the gate. You know, I mean, just... Uh, so it's a progressive deal, you know. It, uh, it uh, that's been my experience. Um, so when I was, uh, you know, more of this, I heard the other night working working overtime in a good idea factory. I decided when I was uh, forty five that this house I had that was, uh, you know, almost paid off. I decided that I should uh, take out a couple jumbo mortgages and start. Uh, you know, I'd never shot heroin before. I was 50, and uh, so I decided that'd be a good idea. And uh, I really didn't think about it. I don't know. I, you know, I was trying to get some sobriety underneath me before I sold the house because I knew, you know, this house I was going to sell for 600000 That was the best thing I ever did with any money buying that place. Uh, and I knew that that would be an issue, you know, having that kind of money. And uh, so I had 30 days when I sold it, and... Uh, well, let's just say uh, uh, I didn't stay sober and uh, went down hard and uh, was broken six months, living in my truck, sold the truck to the drug man, living in an old motor home. Things got worse and worse. And uh, anyway, I'll, uh, you know, somewhere in there, my neighbor, uh, here's what I did with friendships. My neighbor, uh, who knew me when I was clean and productive, you know, he was big in the longshore deal and uh, offered me this, uh, you know, napkin list way I could get in, uh, start doing longshore and get up to be a registered guy with uh, only 200 hours. And well, I was an hour short when the deadline came because uh, drugs and alcohol were more important. I blew that opportunity off. Just another one of the things that drugs and alcohol took, you know, and, uh, and I still didn't get it, you know, and uh, so, you know, uh, fast track up to, because uh, my time is going to run out here. Um, you know, I uh, was offered a job on a fishing boat, and uh, I call it Seahab. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, it's it's good because you know boats haven't changed a whole lot. Cars start changing a whole bunch, you know, and keeping up with them was going to be an issue. And uh, so anyway, the skipper I'd met back in '88 in AA, and uh, and he let me on this boat, and I call that some kind of divine intervention. You know, I I got this motorhome that I'm living in out by SeaTac uh, because it's near where my dad's living, and he's the only guy left that you know enables me at all. Everybody's cut me off by this point. And, uh, you know, I'm lying, cheating, stealing. I've always been a productive guy, you know. In Hawaii, I'm doing triathlons and starting all kinds of businesses. My whole life, I was self-employed. That that also means too meat-headed to work for anyone. Uh, but uh, I got to a place where I couldn't even keep weeds alive, you know. I, uh, I was shoplifting at, at 50. Cops would arrest me, and, and they'd look at my license and see how old I was, and <laughs> They just let me go. They just thought it was pathetic, you know. <laughs> so there's nothing I'm going to tell you that you don't already know. <laughs> that made me feel bad. <laughs> I'm not even good enough to get arrested, you know. <laughs> so anyway, uh, back to the divine intervention thing. You know, this higher power that we hear about in these meetings, for me, it's, uh, it is a huge part of uh, that and willingness. You know, what it's like, what happened is I had to get willing. You know, I had to believe that I could turn my life around once again, you know, and uh, that's what keeps me going today is, uh, you know, that, you know, sure, when I sobered up, it was I really have blown it, you know. I'm 55, you know, at the time, and uh, it was really uh, it took some work to get to a place where I wasn't beating myself up, uh, dragging myself down, be, you know, thinking everything had already happened, and I really missed the boat, no family, no career, all of this. But the program has let me kind of get – I kind of live in this decade. I won't say that I've totally – I'm completely in the moment, but 
I really try and live today, and I really believe that I got a life ahead of me now, you know, and that um, I have somebody uh, telling me I qualify for this state ferry boat job, you know, and uh, that'd be a, a stretch for me uh, working for the state, but I'm, um, I got the little punch list, and I'm jumping through the hoops, and uh, I got to stay real close to the program to keep in my head that I'm worthy of that, you know, because I, I really trashed myself, you know, my self-esteem, my self-worth, uh, drugs, alcohol took that all away, and uh, it really got me to a pathetic place, and uh, so, you know, I don't believe in a guy up there in robes, you know, answering e-prayers up in the clouds, but uh, I do know, you know, when I put my car off the road, and I roll down a cliff, and I walk away, or when I invite the DEA into my house, uh, and I run, and uh, and, uh, and they got riot shields and guns, and they don't shoot me, you know. Um, when I put stuff in my body and, and, and combinations of things, and I live, something is stepping in there when my best thinking is taking me down, and I call that my higher power, you know. I mean, there's something that obviously has intervened, you know, and... I meet people from the early times in recovery, and they say, you're still alive? And I'm sure you heard that. And, uh, you know, um, so I really got to believe that there is still a life ahead of me. And uh, and I get stronger every day. It gets stronger the more work I do. You know, this, uh, this new sponsor I picked, there's nothing wrong with the old sponsor. He just got too much of a life. His second kid's on the way. He's started a business, uh, you know, he's building houses. He's uh, If I call him between 8 and 8.15, we can spend a little quality time. But, uh, uh, you know, I found another guy that's got something I want, you know, a guy that I, for a long time I thought he was too well, you know. He was always talking about the book, you know, he was talking about sponsors and this and that. Well, the other night I heard him talking. <clears throat> he's missed some meetings. He's going to, you know, he was feeling pretty bad. And, uh so I think maybe there's a shot that he's, you know, he maybe he is for real. So uh, he talked about wanting to look at the book again and work some steps again. And for me, you know, like I say, I have I've worked some steps. I've done the fifth step. I've got to carrying some letters around in case these people that I want to make amends to that won't return my calls in case I bump into them. That longshore guy, you know, I mean, I took that relationship from we need guys like you down there to forget my name you know <laughs> i mean that's <clears throat> and maybe i'll get the chance someday to uh to tell him you know what i got written down there i wrote it down because i won't remember it if i just run into him but uh you know i'm like i say i got a now i uh i go to a lot of meetings i keep at least one service position at any given time um a secretary or something of, of note. Uh, I live in an Oxford house. I pay money to live with a bunch of guys. You know, that is a stretch. I mean, <laughs> uh, it never saw, it was always recommended and I wasn't willing to go quite to that length, you know, but it's saving my bacon. Uh, it's a, uh, it's a 24 seven meeting. You know, I, I'm lucky. I'm in a group with a group of guys with long-term sobriety and not so much sobriety this afternoon. I'm getting in a funk. Thanks for asking me to do this. You know, I start writing stuff down and geez, I, you know, just writing this stuff down and sharing it with my sponsor doesn't just make it go away, you know, uh, saying, uh, praying about it. It doesn't just change, you know, the things I've done are ingrained in there, you know, and uh, by living a good life today and trying to be responsible, I spent a lot of time with my dad. He's 90. You know, I robbed him blind. He was the only guy that would even let me near and, uh, uh, I spent a lot of time with him, you know, trying to get him into working his Kindle and how to answer his email and, uh, you know, stuff that, uh, you know, it's, he saw me and he said, man, this addiction must be really something to take, you know, to just totally change you, you know, he saw what it had done and, uh, and it is, it's a hell of a disease, you know, and it tells me I don't have it if I don't keep coming here and uh, so I 
you know, when I got back, I had this Seahab thing. I go out to, you know, I've done it six years in a row now. The first couple of years, uh, let's just say I didn't stay sober much off the dock. Uh, but uh, the boat is dry. and But it really doesn't do a whole lot for, like, punching in or being to work on time. You show up in April and you're good. You know, <laughs> and uh, and so this state job that I'm looking at is, you know, being somewhere on time is going to be uh, an issue for me. But um, again, uh, I know if I hang out with sober people and I stay away, you know, I'll, I'll close real quick with how the first step was explained to me because it's something I got to remember a lot. You know, I was getting out of a treatment center back in '99 and. And I was in this band, and we had this song, Turn of the Century, and uh, and uh, it became real clear in treatment, well, you can't go to that New Year's Eve party that you've had planned all this time, That just uh, not with those guys, and it made sense, no, I can't. Well, the day before the show, I'm thinking, I'll go, and I'll just leave about 10, that'll work, and uh, my sponsor at the time said, yeah. You know, you probably could. You probably go. You probably go to rehearsal a few times, hang out with those guys. But what you're doing in your head is direct defiance of the first step. You're trying to prove that you got power over the situation that has repeatedly brought you down. And that clicked. That made sense. So I don't hang out in bars, and I don't go to much music. You know, I don't. Uh, I don't do a whole lot of the stuff I used to do. I stayed on that boat for 18 months. You know, I. Then I got a car, then I got a license, then I got an email, then I got an address, you know. Uh, and I'm just slowly trying to work myself back into society and and do what that means, you know. I pay my bills. I went down the other day to the courthouse, the superior court, district court, and it paid off everything. And I called Larry and to brag about it afterwards. He says, oh, that's all well and good. Just get the hell out of that neighborhood. <laughs> so, thanks, everybody. Uh, my name is Dylan, and I'm an alcoholic. Okay. Uh, my sobriety date is June 9th, 2013, and my home group is RIP in the CD on uh, Friday nights on 24th in Union, and my sponsor is Stuart. I just got a new sponsor. Um, cool, yeah, so I'm incredibly nervous. Um, I've been sober for two and a half years coming up, and every time I get asked to chair a meeting or speak or go to a, on a panel, I'm just as nervous as the very as the very first time. It's, um, anyway, um, so I'm an alcoholic, and um, what that means to me is that um, I suffer from a mental obsession. Um, when I put drugs and alcohol in my body, I have a profound physical reaction. And I suffer from something uh, called a a spiritual malady, or I like to put it a a, a soul sickness. Um, so what it was like for me um, was uh, every night before I'd go, every night before I'd fall asleep when I would grow, when I was growing up, I would kind of replay the day in my head. Um, and I would, uh, I'd sort of brutalize myself for everything that I did wrong or what I thought I could have done better, or how I said something really stupid or embarrassing. And I would just sort of replay this over and over, this, this, this film of my day in my head, and I would obsess about that. And I would come up with this plan for tomorrow on how I would um, behave and act in a way that I would then get you to like me or I could fit in with the cool kids or I'd get the girls to like me or how I'd be, um, a, you know... Um, do something really cool or interesting and um, have everyone just have their jaws hanging out open when I was done at how awesome I was. So um, I would obsess about that over and over and over and over and over again. And um, um, I have also have this uh, profound physical reaction to drugs and alcohol. And when the first time I took um, Vicodin at 12 years old from a knee surgery, um, all of that obsessing, it just it just stopped. And the um, the third part of this disease, this sort of soul sickness, I uh, I just kind of conceptualize it as a as having a god sized hole somewhere in me, and. Um, that that became filled, and that was okay. And I had this overwhelming calm and peace that uh, I was okay, like I had arrived, like I'm good. 
And I've always just wanted to, to, to feel okay. I've never felt okay. I've never felt comfortable in my skin. I've never felt comfortable with who I was. Um, I've always thought I was weird, different, and strange. Um, I always wanted to be like my older brothers. Um, I always wanted to be like the professional skiers I saw and looked up to. And I thought how they were so cool and how different that I was and how perfect my life would be if I could sort of get this. And when, um, when I had knee surgery from skiing at 12 and I, and I took that Vicodin, um, it was just peace. Like, uh, I remember thinking like, this is, this is, um, this is what I've been missing. Like, this is the missing link for me. Like, I'm, I'm corrected. I'm corrected when I put drugs and alcohol in my body. Um, so that's sort of what it was like. What happened is I continued to seek that out um, for uh, 14 more years. And uh, I needed more and more. I needed to do worse and worse things to continue to, to, continue to feel okay. Um, um, addiction took me, alcoholism and addiction took me to some very dark places. Um, I was homeless for a while. I was living out of my car, um, not bathing or showering for months on end. Um, committing crimes, committing a lot of crimes. Um, I was a corrupt gold buyer for a while and I bought all of your stolen gold and um, <laughs> and, um, man, I, don't know, I did a lot of, I did a lot of things that a lot of us in here have to do to sort of get our things, and, we, and like, this thing is a progressive disease, and it takes us to some really dark places. Um, I had the opportunity to get sober, um, a lot earlier on than I did. Uh, it became very clear I had a problem, and I went to treatment. And, um, I was, uh, my story is that I was in and out of treatment for a long time. Um, I didn't get this thing right away. My first time in treatment, they put a, a video, um, up on the screen in group and it was talking about, um, mice in a lab and, uh, they would, um, set up this experiment for the mice to, um, click a little lever and they would get fed and they would click another lever and it would give them some cocaine. And the mice, um, after learning this, would just press and press and press and press and press the lever for cocaine until the mice died. And when I'm seeing this, I jumped up and freaked out and started screaming that you can't equate um, a human intelligence to that of a mouse. <laughs> and, um, and, I started, and I started crying and freaking out. I had this, this like very profound response to this. <laughs> And um, I was so offended that they were thinking that that I was as stupid as a as a mouse. Like, so it's it's safe to say that um, my first time in treatment, I, I didn't get it. Like I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get what this was all about. I didn't I didn't see it. I had a violent reaction to being told I was an alcoholic or an addict. Um. I thought that meant I was weak, that I was stupid, I was that I had a weak will. I was um it was a moral failing. Um, um No, nah, you know, man, to be honest, it just meant that I couldn't I couldn't do oxycotton anymore and that really pissed me off. Like <laughs> like I don't know about you guys, but like drugs and alcohol really worked for me and then and, and like they work very well and I love that feeling that I get. I really do and if drugs and alcohol still work for you, I don't know why you're trying to get sober. Because for me, they stopped working for me, and I continued to use them. And they stopped working for me, and despite all of these negative consequences that piled up and piled up and piled up, I continued to use them until I even got to the point where I really no longer wanted to use anymore. I had some experience. I had, I had like 50 days, 58 days of sobriety. It was my, my third time in inpatient treatment after my sixth stint in a psych ward after countless psychologists, countless detox centers, all of these things. I finally had 58 days sober, and I loved it, and I, and I didn't want to use or drink ever again. I wanted to be sober. And... And I was living in a sober living house, and my roommate at the time um, 
was like, hey, my uh, my sister has some Adderall. Um, I think I want to take some of her Adderall. And I was like, well, yeah. I was like, well, you know, my shoulder is kind of, is kind of messed up. Like, I could go to the doctor and get Percocet. Because you don't really want to take Adderall by itself. Like, you got to, like, balance that out. You know what I mean? And uh, I was like, well, you know, my, my shoulder hurts. Like, I can go get, I can go get Percocet. And from just that conversation, like just having that conversation, within 30 minutes, I'm on a bus driving down, driving down to Third and Pike to buy crack and heroin. For 30 minutes after that conversation, and while I'm on that bus, I am screaming on the inside, just screaming, "Get off this bus! Don't go down there! Don't do this! You don't want to do this!" And I'm having an out of body experience, watching myself relapse, and I'm just screaming on the inside, "Just run!" And I can't. That was the scariest moment in my entire life when I wanted to be sober from the bottom of my heart and found that I couldn't do it. What do I do then? <clears throat> like, what, what is there? What other options are there for me? Like, what do I do at, at, that, at that time? Like, complete and utter hopelessness, you know? Like, you just give up, you know? Like, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an, I'm an alcoholic. I'm an addict. This is, this is just my lot in life. Luckily enough... Um, I ended up getting caught uh, using in a sober living house. I looked at that as something that was awful at that time. Um, Just don't you know that, like, at 50 days sober and going to meetings and not working steps, like, I know what to do. Like, this is so inconvenient. I had so many cool things going on, and I wanted to be sober. So, like, getting caught and having to go back to treatment is just, that's just such a a terrible thing. Um, Looking back now, it's one of the, I'm, I'm so grateful for that because it was an opportunity for me to really just give up and real and an opportunity to say that all of my ideas are are bankrupt. My idea bank is overdrawn. I have no other ideas left. I have no other plans. Every time I went to treatment in the past, I had plans for when I got out of there. I still had schemes. I still had plans, and I was at this point where I had nothing left. I had no more options. And we call it the gift of desperation uh, in this program, and, and I definitely definitely had that. And upon going into that um, last treatment center over in, in Port Townsend, um, it was a five-month program. They take us out into the woods. They take us out into the wilderness for a while. And it was a chance for, really for me to get quiet and um, sort of reflect. And... Um, and uh, I was I was defeated, and um, that's when uh, a crack opened. That uh, my higher power. That's where that's where God came in, um, and uh, my life has 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 never been the same. From that time of of admitting that I had utter and complete defeat over this thing, the obsession to use was was lifted. You see, the obsession to use and drink was lifted. Now that doesn't say that I was completely out of the water, and that isn't to say that um, <clears throat> it's easy. Sobriety is one of the hardest things I've ever done. It's, the, my, it's something that I'm uh, the most proud of in my life. It's my greatest accomplishment. It is my greatest asset, and um, and I could not have done it alone. Um, AA has saved my life. Um, and I continue to see it work in other people's lives, and it's and it's there's really no words that that can describe that because I was hopeless. Like I, there was no there was no shot for me. Uh, at the end of my using, I had lost touch with reality completely. I had voices in my head. I didn't know what, what was real and what was not real. Uh, suffering from paranoid schizophrenia, from meth induced uh, psychosis, and um. <laughs> This has been a this has been a complete and utter rebuilding of my life from the from the ground up. Um, this program has put, like taken the little pieces, the fractured self that I was, and sort of put me back together. I believe I've had a a, a fundamental rewiring. We call it a psychic change, um, and that's a result of working um, the twelve steps as outlined in the big book with the sponsor. And. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to say. This program, this program, this program works. Like, ta-da! <laughs> I uh, I have a I have a new lease on life. Like, I have a, 
I have a life today. And it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful and painful, and there's so many things, and like I'm just now, I feel like the steps were like a ticket back to life. They definitely don't, didn't for me guarantee a peaceful and happy and sort of amazing life. I see it as sort of like a ticket back to life, and I get all of the all of the things that life comes with. Um, I've gone through a lot in sobriety in my short time. I've learned a lot about myself. Um, I've gone back to school. I graduated from the University of Washington. I'm thinking about uh, planning, I'm going to grad school um, in philosophy, something that um, I, I really love. And um, this program has sort of given me the courage to, to to get to know myself and to, even though like studying philosophy is, um, hmm, how should we say this? Um, a lot of people see it as useless. Um, having the courage to say like, I come from a family of engineers. Um, my dad's an electrical engineer and uh, he doesn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> does not get it at all but this program gives me the courage to say like I've gone in touch with myself and and I see uh, uh, and this is something I really love doing and I really love um, teaching others and helping others with with these sorts of things and and um, discovering that I like teaching and one day I, I, I plan I hope a dream to be a, a philosophy professor uh, is a dream that I have so I don't know the only thing I cared about before was well, um, <laughs> seven, six, five, four, <laughs> three. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. I'm out. <laughs> Hello, I'm Molly. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Um. So I'm a little nervous right now, but it's all right. I um I chaired a meeting on Friday, and so I kind of got a taste of some public speaking. Um, I've been kind of just uh, thinking just, you know, what I want to talk about, you know, all that stuff. It's kind of hard, um, really, you know, when you go back to pick through all the pieces. But um, talking with some people down here, it's... Uh, when did I first know that I was an alcoholic? I'm 27, um, and my sobriety date is July 7th, 2013, so I'll have two years um, coming up in July. And my home group is Salmon Bay, which meets on Fridays at uh, the 7.30. That's right. Thank you, guys. Um, so basically, my story starts when I was pretty young. Um, I was, like, about 13 and um, I come from a really large Norwegian family in Ballard. I grew up in this area, actually grew up right down the street. And um, all of my family drank. Uh, my parents, I have no brothers and sisters, and I'm an only child. Um, I've had family members die from alcoholism, like literally drinking themselves to death and uh, health problems, everything. So it was kind of, um, it was natural when I was 13, I, of course, started drinking booze that just was literally right in front of me from everyone else drinking it. And it wasn't a really big deal. Uh, I started bringing it to school when I was pretty young, even in middle school. And um, I was kind of always known as the girl who would bring it with me. And I can't really understand what it was about it. I hated the taste. I, I still hate the taste, which is kind of peculiar to say that. But I loved the effect. When I drank, it was... It was, I didn't care what it was, like it could taste like rubbing alcohol. And I would, if I could get a chaser, I would just chase it, you know? So it was like, I would just get it down. Didn't matter, you know, it was disgusting. So I would like even be drinking like Kahlua or something, you know? And then it's like, the chaser really didn't, I feel like do anything. It was maybe just kind of like a little side thing that made me feel better about it, you know, that I would honestly probably just drink anything. But um so that's how it was. I would bring that to school. And it was kind of looking back, it was a, you know, it's obviously like a, whoa, red flag. But then it was kind of like, cool girl, you know, she's just trying to get, get in with the cool people and get liked and everything. And, um, and then, and it kind of just continued like with that. I just was drinking on and off and like always at parties. And I didn't have any brothers or sisters. So, um, 
being being social was hard for me, like going to parties and meeting people. Like I didn't have any brothers or sisters to introduce me to anyone. Like I had to go up to these random people, you know, and be like, hi, I'm, I'm Molly. Yeah, nothing, you know, just me. I'm here, you know, take me. And it was, it was nerve wracking for me. I, I had a really, I had such bad anxiety. I still do, but it's a lot better now. And the alcohol really helped. It was especially through high school. That was my golden ticket. You know, it's like, I could always be the girl who got booze, you know, and I could always be the girl that could drink booze, you know, cause I was really good at drinking. I could drink with the guys and everything. That was my ticket. And I definitely skated on that. I, um, I've always been pretty tall and I was, I was very tall when I was 13 and even taller when I was 15. I was probably the same height I am now. So I was always able to hang out with people who are a little older than me too. And when I was 15, I was dating this guy who was a couple years older than I was. And this was the first time I'd gotten in trouble, trouble with the law. And I was driving his car when I was 15. So I didn't even have a driver's license because he was too fucked up to drive because he was drinking, but he was also on pills too. So, you know, since I had only had beer, then it made sense. So I was driving his car and I got pulled over and I got a DUI when I was 15 before I even had my driver's license. And that was kind of a conundrum for um, the King County. <laughs> like, they're like, what do we do? Like, we don't even know how to try this girl. Like, she's, and I'm sitting there and I'm trying to look as innocent as possible. I'm like wearing my cross from like confirmation. And I'm like, I really don't do this, you know? And they're like, oh, okay, I think, you know? And I kind of don't even really know where that went. It's like somewhere in my file, tucked away, some deep dark corner. But, um, and so, Basically, I kind of got through that, and I was like, whoa, that was crazy and everything. And uh, I, I, went, I went to high school, and I went to a very, um, I went to a very liberal high school. And um, I, really, I really loved it. It was great. But uh, with, it, you know, my mom, she sometimes, she likes, not sometimes, she always likes to be like, I wonder what it would be like if we kept you in a private school and everything. And I was like, oh, I don't think it would have turned out the way you would have thought. I was so strong-willed. And so, like, ever since that, when I was 13, and I knew what it felt like to have that feeling just, like, of all the uncomfortables, like, just lifted off of me, there was nothing she could have done. And I try and tell her this all the time, that it was, like, my, how I relied so heavily on alcohol from that point on, there was just no way you could turn that around. And I try and tell her that. Because even with all this freedom, um and everything else in this high school that I went to and all these opportunities and things like that, I still just messed them up, you know, to the, to the biggest extent you could possibly get to. Um, let's see. I definitely ended up dropping out when I was 17. I didn't even finish high school. Um, and let's see. <sighs> There's a lot of things that happened around that, and I'm trying to remember. Um, and I, sorry, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to recall here. I'm like going in the stairs in my brain right now. Um, so anyway, so yes, I dropped out of high school, and um, then I kind of was on my, I moved out. That was the other thing, too, is I like looking back now on all of like just how I grew up and how like I was drinking so heavily at such a young age, you know, I didn't really get to, um, I didn't really get to just live that life. You know, I kind of always, always bouncing around to different things and having different things work, you know, be like, Oh, this isn't working because of that or that. Well, let's just try this out and just kind of keep going and going and going. And, you know, just basically burning bridges already at 17, you know, and like not really knowing which way I'm going to go. And so just basically going the only way that it will let me. And um, the only way that I kind of really knew is just, you know, moving out and then just starting to work and just kind of partying and everything. And I didn't even know what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, and then I was... Wow, 15 minutes goes by fast. <laughs> so I'm going to just fast forward here. Uh, 
I was I was 19 when I um, when I got my second DUI, and I hit a car this time. The first time I didn't, but the second time I did, and I ended it. And my my logic for the whole thing was I was drinking really close to my house, and I'd taken a whole bunch of shots. And I thought if I got home in time, they would hit me when I got home. <laughs> you know, I was like, no, it was worth that way. And I hit this car, and I was like, let's pull over. And so by the time the cops there, I was blacked out. Like, it was so bad. And I got arrested. Um, I got put in jail, and I was in jail for five days. <sighs> That's an experience. I still recall that and tell people about it because everyone's like, you've been to jail? Let's talk about this. And it's, um, <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's something that, you know, uh, it's funny. It really is. Because that's like the maximum amount of time you want to spend in jail, you know, because <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, you never want to spend any time in jail, but I feel like it does humble some people. Let's get real. You know what I mean? So it's it's good for that. And um, I went to treatment and the entire time I was in treatment, I I lied. I lied a lot. Like, I, I gave them truths about my drinking and I told them when, you know, I had started and I basically told them all this stuff, but I did not tell them how often and how much, because if I did, then they would definitely know, you know, and also I don't know if they'd believe me too, because when I drank, I didn't drink every day, but when I did drink, I drank a lot and it didn't stop. And it was normally until I was very sick or just not there anymore. And so I did that and I kept it under control. So with my drinking, I was actually able back way back when in treatment to drink this amount then stop, be good for a day or two, do my pee test so you can get out of there. And I thought I was in the clear for um, a really long time. And I just uh, kind of continued to live life that way, the same way that I treated treatment, is I would fuck up a lot from my drinking. I would, bur I would, I would lose jobs. Or, sorry, I, I would mess up a lot. <laughs> and um, I, I would lose jobs, numerous friendships, numerous relationships, um, I would do and say things that were very embarrassing that I couldn't, I couldn't look at people, you know? And so I would almost just avoid just everything. I maybe even wouldn't go back to work if I said something embarrassing and then just be like, oh, I'm fired probably, you know, and just go away. And that's how I would literally, I, I would not return back to places because I was just unsure of how people thought of me. Cause I didn't know what I thought of myself and I couldn't stand them judging me in a way that, you know, was, different, I guess. And it's just, it was horrifying for me. So basically I have a lot of other stuff that happened too. Um, God, I even tried moving to another city. Of course, we all think that like all of us be like, Oh, life would just be so much different. I went to a new city and just got all new friends, new people, new job, everything. And and it'd be even better if it was sunny, you know? And I did that. I did that. I moved to Southern California and I started over and you know what? It was worse. I drank more than I ever drank before in my whole life. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I had, I had everything that I thought I would want in a year. And then a year and six months later, oh my gosh, I was getting run out of the city. No joke. Like I had lost my job and one day I'd lost all my friends and everything. And I, I called my dad and I was really sick because I was, I had drank like, I drank a whole bottle of Jameson the night before. And I was just like, I was still kind of like blacked out in the morning. And I told him, I was like, ah, oh, so I think I lost my job and blah, blah, blah. And the tone in his voice was like, I'm flying out tomorrow and then you're moving back here. And I didn't know how he was going to do it or anything, but he, he had understood that I just couldn't be there anymore. So he came back. And when I came back to Seattle, um, I really tried to quit and cut down. And I tried to cut down a lot. And I thought I was doing really, really well. In fact, I thought I was doing better than I'd ever done in my whole life before. You know, and I was like, some things were kind of normal. My life was stable for a solid six months. That was a record. And um, and then on my night where I decided to drink water and all this other stuff, I got pulled over a third time. And this is where it gets kind of trickier with my story is um, I got pulled over and I blew a .083 which is the legal limit. Um, 
I still got arrested for uh, DUI, and um, I was still charged as a um, second offense, because I guess the very first one doesn't count. Um, and even though it had been from, it was, so basically when you get a, a, another DUI, um, for it to be a first or second offense, they have to be within seven years. I was two months away from it being seven years and it being my first offense and then basically just getting it dropped to a negligent. So I literally was got right in there and it didn't matter that I blew right above the limit or anything like that. I was still getting charged with this massive incident and it kind of like, it made me feel really angry. I was like, I was so close. I was so close. I was doing so good, you know, and like I was two months away from it, just like blah, blah, blah. I spent all this money on a lawyer. I was really justified about this, you know, like life is really, it, I have no regrets in life. I can say that except for this. This is dumb. Like, ugh. and then, and like, so I had to make this choice. Like I was trying to fight off the second event where I was going to have to spend 45 days in jail. And I was thinking that, that, that changes, that changes a girl, you know, 45 days. That's a long time. I was like, I'm going to be coming out of there a different person, you know? And so I made this choice and I was just like looking around, looking at my, my family, my friends, I'm almost done. And, uh, I was like, you know what? I wonder what life would be like without alcohol, because it has been the one factor in my life that has just been constantly like the devil on my back, you know? And so I came into this and I came, went into treatment. I came in to AA with a, com a new willingness that honestly I, I love. In fact, I was thinking about it today, like just before I was coming here, you know, and like when she asked me to speak and I was just like, oh yeah, of course, you know, and it's like, it is, it's like this willingness to just, get up and, and come here and talk to you guys and, and to try something new. And I've had a lot of people trying to intervene in my life for a very young time. And like, it definitely took this small little intricate things for it to like, be like, Whoa, crap, I get it. You know, I'm going to start taking this seriously. And my life is oh, it's so much better than it was before. And I have real genuine friendships, like, you know, and I care about people and they're teaching me things. And I have a clearer set of where I'm going to go instead of like, not like what's going to happen when I fuck up, you know? And that's a completely different way of living for me. And it's, it's, it's been great. So thank you for letting me talk. <laughs> Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.